you know, we all know the word grace. I think many of us are introduced to grace the same way I was, thinking back, when did I very first hear about grace? Many of us first heard about grace when we were children and we would sit down for a meal and an adult at the table would say, let's all bow our heads and say, grace. And from that, many people think that grace is nothing more than a prayer. But grace is far greater than that, far, far greater than that. Grace, I believe, is the single, single most weighty word in any language anywhere on the planet. And I think that because I don't believe that word is from this dimension. You know, there are other very profound words in the Bible like love and mercy that I can find some point of reference in my life to somewhat define, somewhat. Negligible maybe, but somewhat. I can find something in my life that can sort of somehow, somehow identify with love or mercy. But there is nothing in my life or in your life that can actually comprehend the depths and the magnitude of the word grace and what grace has done for us and what grace continues to do for us and what grace will always do for us. And I'm trusting tonight that the Holy Spirit will help me help you look at grace in a different way. Uh, grace actually comes from a Hebrew word, charis. It comes from the Hebrew word charis. And that word, I'm sorry, not the Hebrew word, it's a Greek. It comes from the Greek word. It's a Greek word, charis. And it means, it has a dual meaning. It means to give something cheerfully. So the expectation of the recipient is something joyful. But it also means no expectation from the giver. No expectation at all from the giver. God gives us grace. One of the most classic definitions of grace is unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. Nothing we can do to earn grace ever, 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 ever. You can't work it up. You can't be good enough. There's nothing you can do to earn the grace of God because he freely, freely gives that grace. We're going to look at grace in the scriptures tonight from a couple of perspectives, and then uh, I am going to challenge you somewhat. Uh, let's look first at um, Acts chapter 11. Uh, just to give you a little background here, um, the new church in Jerusalem is flourishing. Uh, and they are proselytizing each other everywhere they go. The message of the crucifixion and the resurrection is spreading, but it's only spreading among the Jews. It's not going any further than that. And they think that it's because they are the chosen ones. It's been given to them, and it's only for them. And unbeknownst to them, the message of the gospel of grace is spreading outside the boundaries of Jerusalem and outside of the Jewish faith, or those who were Jewish by faith. And so we're going to begin and look at the story in Acts chapter 11. I'm going to begin in verse 22, and I'm reading out of the NIV translation. You know, this was quite a, uh, a startling fact for the Jews to find out that the gospel was being sent to others because there was a great intolerance <laughs> for the Gentiles, actually a hatred for the Gentiles. All right, I'm in verse 22. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also. <laughs> How dare they? Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Verse 21. Uh, and the Lord's hand... 
I guess I started earlier than 22, huh? The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord, and news of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and so the church in Jerusalem sent Bartimaeus to Antioch to check things out. And when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. So Bartimaeus is sent by the Jewish believers in uh, Jerusalem. Is that my phone? <laughs> okay. Well, I guess we better turn that alarm off. Thank you. I turned my phone off and the alarm still goes. Huh. Bad girl. Bad girl. All righty. So Barnabas shows up at this newly formed church of Greek believers in Antioch. And he is amazed, absolutely amazed, and he can do absolutely nothing except to attest to what has happened there as being an act of grace. It's an act of God's grace to share this news with the Greeks as well as with the Jews. So now time goes on, and we'll continue in Acts 11 in verse 25. Now, Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So now there is all of this hustle and bustle going on in Antioch amongst the Gentiles. The Jews were no longer just the ones that were entitled to the message of the gospel. And for that, you and I need to be grateful because we would have never heard the gospel had it not spread about abroad amongst others than, others than the Jews. And so the grace of God, we see, uh, actually brought the message of the gospel. And then let's continue on. Barnabas and Paul after they were in Antioch for a year, began traveling. They went to Cyprus. They went to several other places. And then they ended back in Antioch of, it's called Pisadia. I think it's close to what it's called. And we're in Acts chapter 13 now. Acts chapter 13, verse 42, and it says this. Again, this is the NIV translation. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. And when the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. Continue in what? The grace of God. So the new converts saw that Paul and Barnabas were operating in grace. So Grace is both a noun and it's a verb. Grace is something that is and something that does. Grace is and grace does. And so grace, 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 what, what is all of that? What is that? What is grace? What does it mean to have grace operating in our lives? We have a really difficult time wrapping our brain around this because in our world, everything we get, we earn. Everything we get, we earn. Uh, I, I shared with you, I finished a course yesterday, a Keras course yesterday, and had to take a test. Well, when I took the test, if I did not earn a hundred on the test, I didn't get a hundred on the test. If I only answered 80% of the questions right, I did not get a hundred on the test. I got what I earned, correct? If you play a sports, any kind of a sport, and at the end of the game, your team has less points than the other team, you lose, period. There, there is no discussion here. There is no debate. You lost because you didn't earn the win, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, graduating students, doctors and lawyers going to take their board exams. If they do not pass the board exams, it doesn't matter how great they did in their undergraduate work. It doesn't matter that they were absolutely outstanding in their residency. If they don't pass the boards, they are not doctors and they are not lawyers. Why? Because they didn't earn it. And everything in life for us is like that. We get it because we earn it. You'll remember during the impeachment trials of Donald Trump, we heard this phrase all the time, quid pro quo, quid pro quo. Did you, qu 
quid. La, 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 la. Quid pro quo. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Did you ever even know what that meant? <laughs> you probably heard it 300 times and you go, what in the world is that? That means to do something for someone expecting a favor in return. Mm -hmm. Doing something to get something. And everything in this world operates that way. We earn it or we don't get it. That's just how it is. Grace cannot even begin to compare with our worldly standards because grace has nothing to do with earning. Grace has absolutely nothing to do with what we do. We are saved by grace. It's a gift. God just gives the gift. He just gives the gift. And in everything we do in life, everything, we either operate in grace or we operate in flesh. Everything. Everything. You're going to see that a little clearer in a couple of minutes. There is no gray for us. We're either spirit or carnal. That's all there is to it. Paul tells us in the book of Romans that when we are carnal, when we lean to doing it ourselves, when we lean to earning it ourselves, fixing it ourselves, figuring it out ourselves, that we are carnal. And carnality always leads to death. Always. It always leads. Not that you're going to drop dead today. I don't mean that. But you begin to die in many other areas. You begin to die in your relationship with God. You may begin to die in relationships with people around you. Things begin to wither because you're trying to do it outside of the grace of God. God's grace came to give us Jesus. And that was just the beginning. That's just the beginning. Grace is available to us for absolutely everything we need. Everything. Absolutely everything we need. Nothing missing, nothing broken for us. Jesus has already paid the price. A finished work is already done. And there's absolutely nothing we need, not today, not tomorrow, not for any day for the remainder of our life that hasn't already been provided. And so, you know, when you're on your knees or sitting in your prayer chair or however you pray and you're begging God for something that you need, you're just, you're just blowing wind. You're just basically throwing air up to nowhere because he's going blah, 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 blah. <laughs> not necessarily, but uh, he's not listening to those whiny baby prayers. He's listening for those who are filled with faith in his grace. That's what he's listening for. He's listening for us to open up our mouth and to agree with what he's already given. All he's looking for, all God's looking for is someone to agree with him. And, you know, when we finally wise up and start to do that, life is going to get a lot sweeter for us, a whole lot sweeter for us. Most of you know the story of John Newton. John Newton was a slave trader. He uh, was going up and down the coast of Africa, and he was kidnapping young men that if they could survive the trip, he was taking them to America to sell them as slaves. And in the course of time, John Newton became a believer in Jesus Christ. He was converted. And he became so convicted over what he had done to hundreds, at that point, hundreds of young men, many who did not survive, many he could never find again. He, was, he really wanted to do restitution. He wanted to find them and get them back to Africa with their families. And he, he spent the rest of his life attempting to do that. But we know John Newton best for one song that he wrote. He wrote the song, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. Because he got a glimpse of what grace had done for him. He got a glimpse of that. And you know, you know that song, I know that song, most of the world knows that song. But we really still don't quite understand how amazing grace really is. Grace has already provided for us what we need, and grace is available for us every hour of every day. And yet we scoot through life living depraved sometimes, lost sometimes, confused a lot of times, worried, upset, we go through our cycles in life when all we have to do is lean in to that grace. 
That's all we have to do is be mindful of it, renew our minds. The Bible tells us that that's what we need to be doing in every area of our life. We need to lean in. Oh, Nancy, that's a beautiful picture. Thank you. Lean in. I like that. That's it. That's, I hadn't seen that, how sweet that is. Just being able to lean in, just lay your head. Do you see yourself as that little child? Do you see yourself just leaning, resting, just resting on the, on the shoulder of your father who loves you so immensely and totally and completely, has given his finest and best for you and will never leave you, never forsake you? You know the drill. And yet, why sometimes are we still sick, sad, sorry, broke, oppressed, and depressed? Why? You know, sometimes the people in the church are more messed up than people in the world. Uh, you know, I don't have too many people in the world calling me for prayer. I, I really don't think any. Most of the people that call me for prayer are Christians super messed up. I mean, really messed up. Now, I want to pray for you. I, I do pray for you when you ask, but why are we in this place? Why are we here? Why are we not living that triumphant, glorious, victorious life that Jesus died to give us? Why are we still wallowing around? It's important that we understand that grace is available and we need to make ourselves avail it. We need to do that. We need to do that. Grace is available for everyone. Titus 2.11 tells us this. In Titus 2.11, uh, Paul is writing to his spiritual son, Titus, and he says to him, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all. All. Now, that doesn't say all men who are already saved. The grace of God is given to all, everyone. That means your slimy neighbor. That means, you know, your in-laws that, you know, are just on your last nerve. That means your boss that you think is a snake in the grass. You know, all of those people also have the grace of God available to them. And we all receive the grace of God the same way, by faith. Simply blind faith. As a simple act of our will, we choose to agree with God. And we choose to take that grace that he's already given for us personally, for whatever we need, whenever we need it. The grace of God is not a random thought. The grace of God is a meticulously given gift by a heavenly Father who wants you to know that there is absolutely no reason for you to live in loss or lack or depravity in any way, shape, or form. Jesus died to give us what? An abundant life. An abundant life. Now, we can preach it and we can talk it and we can share that with those that we talk about and talk to, but are we actually living that? Now, just be honest with yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know, how honest are you? Are you really victorious? Are you really walking in all of the high points of the gospel of Jesus Christ, or are you still slacking and lacking? Well, I, I, I'll have to admit, I'm, I'm seeing these low points too. Not that I want to, and I'm getting a broader understanding of how easy it is to step in to some of this apprehension that I've been looking for for a long time. Sometimes we make it so hard. Grace is, like I said, given freely, Liberally, the Bible says that grace is, Peter, 1 Peter tells us that it's, it's manifold. It has lots and lots of layers. It has many, 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 many facets. And grace can grow. There are, there's more grace in some circumstances than in others. How much more? As much as you'll draw on. That's how much more. The, the amount of grace that you receive is the amount of grace you'll pull on or draw on, or ask for. It is so necessary, it is so necessary for us as we're walking into the hour that we're walking into, which is getting darker by the day. Now, you don't, you don't need me to tell you that. 
you know, you can just just go to Walmart for pity's sake. <laughs> That's all you need to do is spend 10 minutes in Walmart. I, I'm amazed at how evil, how blatantly evil is flaunting itself and nobody cares. Absolutely nobody's standing up. Well, I will stand up. <laughs> you know, you may not have my personality, but I, 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 you know, you don't play with me. I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tolerate that kind of stuff in my presence. Sometimes a little scary, so, but that's okay. I, you know, I, I say all the time, I'd rather have wildfire than no fire. You know, so, you know, I, I'm one of, I'm uh, last time I was, last, last month I was talking about the, the four friends of the man, the paralytic, who tore a roof in the hole of uh, the house to drop the paralytic man down in front of Jesus. I said, you know, everybody needs four crazy friends like that. Everybody. And if you ever need one of those four crazy friends, you need my number on speed dial because I am the kind of person that would do that. I, I am wide open all the time in pursuing, hotly pursuing what the Bible says that we can have. And you need to be a little bit more aggressive in that yourself, actually. So let's talk a little bit about the fact that everything God gives, God gives us comes as a gift. Everything comes as a gift. So what is it that you need from him? What do you need? What do you need? Do you need health? Do you need money? Do you need to not be af afraid? Or do you need to not be depressed? What is, it that, what is it that the enemy's just chewing you up and spitting you out over? What is that? Whatever it is, God has an answer for you already, and all you need to do is lean in to his grace to receive it. All you have to do is press in a little closer to what he's already given to receive it. I've, I've read this here before, but it's been a while. There's a poem. I don't have any idea who wrote this poem, but I think it's a clever poem. It's just called Two Birds. You can find it. You can Google it, poem, Two Birds, and you'll find it. This is the poem. Two birds were sitting in a tree, and one asked the other, do you see what I see? The second replied, oh, yes, I do indeed. Those are humans running to and fro. They're troubled, confused, and worried, and they don't know where to go. And the first sighed and said sadly, oh, it must be that they don't have a heavenly father like you and me. Mm. Matthew 6 tells us that the birds don't sow or reap. You know, that means they don't work and they don't have savings accounts or 401ks. <laughs> and yet the father cares for them. We need to remember the birds. Remember the birds. When you think things are crashing and burning around you, when you don't have enough money at the end of the month, when things are not going the way that it should, you need to remember you have a heavenly father who is filled with grace. There is nothing you can do to bankrupt that grace. Nothing. You can't do it. I can't do it. All humanity cannot do it. Nothing can bankrupt that grace. When I'm listening to things like climate change and climate control and the earth is going to dissolve and burn up and we're all going to die, well, of course we're not. You know, God, God did not create this earth to not have enough. We have more than enough. There is more than enough for all of us to survive and thrive in this earth as long as the earth remains. And so when you're listening to that stuff on tra that trashy stuff, you need to stop saying, uh-uh, not in my house. Uh-uh, no, uh-uh, no, I'm not having it. I learned that from Gloria Copeland. She said she used to talk back to the television all the time when it would start saying whatever, whatever, whatever. She said, not my house. No, we're not having that. We're not having that in my house. No, I forbid that in my house. It's not coming to my house. Mm -mm, no, uh-uh, no way, no way. Because you, know, you cannot listen to a news report without it being horror and sadness and gloom and doom. Uh, the news channel that Lee listens to always ends with what they say is a good story. You know, they always end with one good story. Well, that's three minutes or less after all the rest is trash. 
And, and if you are in the flesh at all, you're so totally depressed by the time you get to that story, that little story doesn't make a difference at all. It's just like, wow, you know, why, why bother? So what I'm wanting us to do is to understand that grace is available. It's fully, fully available. The song that the team sang at the end, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. That is actually just the chorus of a, of, of a song, a longer song. And I want to read to you a little bit of the song itself. It's written by Matthew Spitz, and it says this. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and all our, our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, that's where the blood of the lamb was spilled. The blood of the lamb made a way for you and me to be 100% free. 100% free. 100%. Do you need gifts of grace from God? Absolutely you need them. And they are available. They're absolutely available. You know, the Bible tells us that judgment is the hardest on those who know the truth and do nothing with it. After tonight, you're going to hear again how important it is that you lean in to the grace of God. You absolutely are totally, completely dependent upon it, even if you don't recognize that. You are not able to even breathe without grace. You're not, your heart doesn't beat without grace. You're not able to walk or talk or function without grace. You weren't able to drive here tonight or home without grace. Grace is so freely given, and we tend to give it no thought at all, absolutely no thought at all. I'm wanting us to have a more in tuned understanding of grace and its importance in our life. That unmerited giving, it's actually an expression of God's love. It's love in action. Grace is love in action. That's exactly what it is. God loves, he gives, and 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 he gives. And you and I are created in his image, so we have his DNA in us once we're born again. We have access to that. So we have access to everything he is and everything he has. We have access to that grace being able to operate in us. So I was um, praying the other day, praying over a situation someone had presented to me a serious, serious financial situation, one of those going down the tubes and lavender blowing up and never seeing the end of day. Have, have you ever had those moments, or do you know anybody that ever has? Mm -hmm. And as I was praying about that, the Lord said along these lines, and that's where the title came from, he said, lean in to my grace to give them the wisdom to create wealth. Lean in to my grace to give them the wisdom to create wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18 tells us that God has given us the power to get wealth. It does not say God gives us wealth. It not, there's not a scripture anywhere that says that God's going to open up the heaven and he's just going to dump a bunch of money on you. The Bible says he's given us the power, meaning the ability, to get the wealth that we need. And so if you are in a situation of lack, that's a word for you. You need to lean in and say, Father, I receive your grace to receive your wisdom to create wealth. I receive that grace. I take that grace. I, I make myself available to that grace. So what else do you have a need of? Let's just go through the list a little bit. I made a short list, and it's a very short list because I'm sure there's 5,000 other things that we can put on there. But what do you need to lean into God for? Um, you can say, I come boldly before your throne. Why? Because the throne room is where the action is. I always say that the throne room is where the action is. Hebrews 4, I believe it's verse 16, says this. Let me find that scripture. I wrote it down for us. Hebrews 4, 16. 
This, I believe, is the King James. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we, what? May receive mercy. We go to the throne room to receive mercy and find what? Grace. grace. Find grace to help us in our time of need. When you need anything from God, you need to take a road trip to the throne room. That's where you need to go. You need to take a road trip. Just get a little, little road trip to the throne room because you're going to receive the mercy that you need and find the grace you need there. No place else. It, it doesn't exist any place else. It only exists at the throne. It's so important that we go regularly. And the Bible tells us to go boldly, to go boldly. We don't need to come whimpering in. You know, Jesus isn't going to come someday and sneak in and steal us out of here. He bought us. <laughs> Let me tell you, he, when it's time for us to go, he's going to take us. The ones that are living at the time of his return are going to go out triumphantly, gloriously, with a bunch of fanfare. Because he's not going to just slither in and sneak us out. If you've ever believed that, you need to erase that picture out of your brain. So what do you need? Let's just go through this together. Perhaps you're dealing with anger. You just can't get past an anger issue. You need to be going before the throne of God and say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I receive mercy to eradicate this anger in my life forever. Or fear. Or depression. What is it that's just choking the life out of you? Grace is already given to help you overcome that. Leaning into that grace is what's going to bring the deliverance. What about health? What, how's your health? Do you need grace for your physical body? Are you having back problems? Are you having heart problems? Are, are you dealing with diabetes or arthritis? or What's going on in your life? What's the deal? Whatever it is, you can lean in to the grace of God because it's from the grace, that river of grace, that your answer is going to come. It's already been given. It's already there. But you need to release it to you to receive it for you. And so you need to be saying, I need to be saying, Lord, I receive your grace. I receive your grace for, and whatever it is, Whatever it is. Uh, what, what if you're addicted? Or what if you're praying for someone who's addicted to anything? I mean, you know, people, not everybody's addicted to drugs or alcohol. You can be addicted to Instagram. You know, how, uh, yeah, but social media is, it's a monster. It's absolutely a monster. I can't tell you how many restaurants I will sit in and just take a look around and people are at the table with their phones doing whatever they're doing and not communicating with each other at all. I saw a thing for a new restaurant. It's an Italian restaurant. I'm trying to think where it was. Oh, I know. It's at the Stockyards. It's at the Stockyards in Fort Worth. It's an Italian restaurant. And they are so adamant that you cannot use their, your phone there that they actually make you lock it up when you come in the door. And if you don't lock it up when you come in the door, you can't come in the door. So they have their little locks. And I thought, that's pr probably a pretty good idea. But what would people say to each other if they had to sit through an entire meal today without a cell phone? What would you do? What would you do? Lee and I were having breakfast one day. Oh, it's been a couple of years ago. And there was a family, a large family. I'm, I don't remember now, maybe six kids. You may remember we were at the Crapery in Anna Maria Island having breakfast. And we both commented on the fact that no one was talking to each other. And every single person, child and adult, every single person had a cell phone. And they were using their cell phone, taking a bite, using their cell phone, taking a bite. They never conversed, not a single word with each other. So if that's you, you have a problem. And you need to lean in to the grace of God to pull away from that thing and be able to spend more time interacting with humans and certainly with your God. And what about bitterness or unforgiveness if you're dealing with that and you just can't get over that? 
You know, what if somebody's just really wounded you or betrayed you or lied about you or hurt you? And you just can't get past it. You just, you think you're okay and everything's okay and then somebody pushes that button. And boy, you're, you're back there all over again. You need grace. You need grace. Because grace is available and grace will set you free. So I am specifically going to camp a little bit on finances. Now, you may think you're comfortable financially, and you may be well comfortable financially. But the purpose we are given money, the purpose for all money, the Bible tells us very clearly the purpose for money is to establish the kingdom of God. The purpose for money is that we have enough and extra, right? Uh, in the New Testament, it tells us in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, I'm not sure exactly, 9, 8, I believe, I'm, I'm scrapping. But it tells us that God is going to give us bread to eat and seed to sow. Bread and seed. Bread and more. Not just for you, not just for your household, you and more. You and more. So we all need to be stretching out, reaching, leaning into God's grace for extra finances. If just us in this room, if just us in this room had double what we needed to live on to sow, and we would sow it, not sit on it. You know, God blesses what we put our hands to, not what we sit on. And so it's so important that we have what we need. God wants us to meet our needs. He says he'll meet his, our needs. But what if he wants to give you more? And what would we do just in this room, just here in this room, and those of you watching on tele television, what would happen if you had all you needed and that much more to sow? Do you know there would not be a ministry anywhere that would be struggling in any way, shape, or form? Because God would speak to you, you'd be able to sow where it needed to go, and there would be the gospel of Jesus Christ going perpetually wherever it needed to go. We're not seeing that. We're not seeing that. I'm going to share a scripture with you uh, as we're getting ready to take the offering. And I think maybe you might think, what in the world does this have to do with the offering? We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says this, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he is denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Well, isn't that a wonderful offering message? <laughs> it's true. It's true. If you're the head of the household and you're not providing for your household, the Bible says you've denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel. That's true. So if that's you, you need to be leaning into the grace of God to fix that. Because God's got the answer for you. He's got a way for you to create wealth so that you can bring wealth into your house. But that's not what I want you to see. What I want you to see is that God lives by this verse. God is not an infidel. You belong to his household. You are his children. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. You have to believe that. And you have to lean into that. When things are tough, things are tight, things don't seem to be working, there's not enough to go around, you need to lean into the grace that your Father God is not an infidel. Your Father God is never going to leave you. Your Father God is never going to abandon you. Your Father God is never going to leave you without. Your Father God is never going to see to it in any way, shape, or form that you suffer or wallow. He teaches us nothing through suffering. He doesn't use the ways of the enemy to teach us anything. He uses his word, period. I want you to begin to lean in to the grace of God where you need it most. What do you need? What do you need? Whatever that is. You need a change in your job environment. You need a restoration in relationships. You've got relationships that need to be healed and mended. 
You need to lean into the grace of God and receive the grace of God. Lean in and receive. Lean in and take. Lean in and make yourself available. Because if you will just spend a little bit of time on that road trip I was talking to you about, going to the throne room and actually asking boldly, asking boldly for the grace that you need for whatever you need, things will change. We will begin to not be the people in the video we saw earlier just getting fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter, but we will be those that are able to take the Word of God and share it with such liberality and such love and such peace that multitudes, multitudes will begin to open up their hearts to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a simple gospel. Acts chapter 20, verse, I think, 34, and again, I think it's in 32, tells us that our only message is the gospel of grace. That's our message. Well, if we don't understand grace, we're not going to be able to preach grace. How important it is that we take this word that I believe is not of this realm and we begin to lean into it and make it our own. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace for whatever you need. This is not a message of condemnation. If you've blown it, grace is there. If you are still blowing it, grace is there. If you're even thinking about blowing it tomorrow, grace is there. Grace is there. It is available for you every hour of every day. That unending, unmerited favor of God. Always available. Just lean in. Just lean in. Grace, grace. So I'm asking you to take a moment. What do you need grace for right now? Are you sick? Are you dealing with heart failure? Are you dealing with dementia? Are you dealing with any problem in your cardiovascular system, your digestive system, your neurological system, anywhere in your body? You know, I've shared with you before, the Lord gave me a prophecy on my feet. I heard it the same time everybody else did, 2017, July 2017. It was a Covenant Life Center meeting. We were still meeting in Apopka at that time, and I'm just a preaching, and the Lord interrupted me. He, he interrupted me. And out of my mouth, I mean literally straight out of my spirit and out of my mouth, never said hey to my head. Thank that's that's a Keith Moore phrase. Never said hey to my head. This is almost verbatim what the Lord said. He said, listen and listen well. Now remember, I didn't know I was going to say that. So when that sort of flies, you know, I'm waiting for the next word too. <laughs> so is everybody else in the room. Listen and listen well. He said, aging is inevitable. But deterioration is under the curse. And you are redeemed from the curse. Lean in to the grace for that. Lean in to the grace for that. There's a young woman in my life. I say, you know, years ago I would have thought this isn't young, but she, she just turned 55, so she's young to me. And... And she was whining and complaining about how getting old stinks and, you know, how bad it is and blah, 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 blah. And I was getting ready to share with her, although she's not a believer, I was getting ready to share that word with her. And the Lord checked me. He said, that word belongs to mine. It doesn't belong to the lost because they're not redeemed from the curse but you are redeemed. You are redeemed. And you need to hold on to that and hang on to that. And when anything starts to attack your physical body, whatever it is, you go to the doctor and you get a bad report, blah, 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 blah. You know, I've had that blah, blah, blah over the last little bit. I shared with you that I had a colonoscopy. 
colonoscopy, yeah. I had a colonoscopy endoscopy and they were just poking and prodding and doing all that stuff that nobody wants to do. And the doctor comes in, Lee's there, and comes in uh, to give me the results of what they saw. And, um, and she begins to go about, well, I'm really concerned about blah, 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 e blah, blah, e blah, 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 blah. And uh, I, without thinking, trust me, you ha this has to be so automatic in you that you don't give it a second thought. I said, I don't believe in being sick. <laughs> now, she's already told me, you're, you're not doing too well. I don't believe in being sick. I don't believe in being sick. You need to say that. I do not believe in being sick. I don't hear you at all. I do not believe in being sick. I don't believe in it. I don't believe in it. I don't believe in it. And now you have another tool, and I'm leaning into the grace. I'm leaning into the grace. So they ordered another dumb, stupid test, and I decided I, I would take it. Um, uh, an internal ultrasound. I never had an internal ultrasound. I thought all ultrasounds were from the outside, but this one was from the inside. And the second test came back absolutely perfect, flawless, absolutely no problem whatsoever. And so what happened from here to here? I do not believe in being sick. I don't believe in it. We need to be perfected in understanding that we're already whole, we're already healed, we're already delivered, we're already free, we're already able to step over and to apprehend every part of the covenant that we have in Christ. Amen? Amen. Lean in, lean in, lean in. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you for grace. I thank you, thank you, thank you for grace. I thank you that you give so freely. I thank you you give so liberally. I thank you that you give without hesitancy or reservation. You just give and give and give and give. And Father, we are learning even now, Father, to ask you more readily, quickly, quickly. We're asking quickly for your grace when we need it. We're asking quickly for you to reveal to us what we need to do to change or rearrange. We're asking quickly, Father, going forward, Lord, we're not going to hesitate. We're not going to wait. Father, we're not going to look around for 12 other answers. Father, we're going to look directly to you and your grace to give us what we need when we need it, to come over to the other side. Father, we thank you for your life and your wholeness. We thank you, oh, Father, that Jesus is magnified and glorified in us. We thank you, Father, that we can lean into you without reservation, without any reservation. We can come before you no matter what we've done or what we've said. And you, Father, extend to us the grace we need to come to the other side free and whole and delivered, covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace, grace. Lean in. Team, will you come and sing that chorus? Lean in. Lean in. You might need to receive grace for 30 things. But that's okay. He's got enough. What do you need to receive grace for? What is it? Lord, in the name of Jesus, I receive your grace. I receive your grace to deal with this depression. I receive your grace. I receive your grace to eradicate this bitterness, this anger, this, this intolerance I have for certain people. I receive your grace, oh Father. I receive your grace to give me the wisdom to create wealth. Thank you, Father. Just receive his grace. That's all he's wanting you to do. Just take it. Just take it. It's freely given. You can take it by faith. You can take it by faith. You can take it for yourself. You can take it for your family. You can take that grace and allow it to manifest itself as wholeness in your life. What do you need?
It's a well that will never run dry. Extended your grace to us, O oh Father, and to every man and every woman and every child everywhere. Father, help us not go through life depending on our own resources, our own wit, our own willpower. Help us, Father. Remind us regularly that your grace is a river that flows continually and it will bring us life everlasting. And when you sow seed into good ministry ground, what you're doing is sowing toward the establishment of the covenant of God and that seed begins to produce a harvest that comes back to you and it comes back on waves if you become a perpetual giver you will be a perpetual reaper that's the promise of god it's his promise lean in to the grace that you might need to reap harvest on seed you've sown you haven't seen harvest yet have you some of that you got some seed in the ground that you haven't seen that harvest on lean in to the grace of god for your harvest to come lean into that. If you're making a check, please make it payable to LMM, that's for Linda Markowitz Ministries, or you can write that whole thing out. 